Good afternoon and welcome to the Virginia Tech Science Festival. My name is Phyllis Newville and I'm directing the Science Festival this year. I'm so glad you all are here. We also um, have friends who are watching online, so everybody wave to this camera right here. Hi friends. Um, so, and also we're filming and the friends online can see you. So just know that there's people watching from the outside and you, you can go back and watch this after the festival is over today. Um, after we are finished with this presentation, uh, we will have an evaluation for those who are under 18. We'll have questions for you about how this went for you. Um, <laughs> and I will ask you to turn off any uh, phones or other things that will make noise during the presentation. When you have questions or want to say something, if you would raise your hand um, and I will come to you with a microphone. If you say something that doesn't go through a microphone, the people online won't be able to hear you. So I appreciate you cooperating or helping me with that. Um, I do want to take a second to say the Virginia Tech Science Festival is a large event. This is our seventh year of Virginia Tech Science Festival, I believe. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time. And this year, it obviously, it's a little different from some of those years when we had 5,000 people in the building. So I thank you for being part of this experiment for how we do it in this sort of COVID time. We also have had um, lots of online meetups this year and also a few school field trips on campus as part of this year's Virginia Tech Science Festival. So I wanna just quickly thank, and not everyone, because I can't thank them all, but, I, but quickly thank everyone who has participated in making this year's Virginia Tech Science Festival possible. I couldn't do it without you and I thank you for all for your help. Now, to this three o'clock session is called Rock Around the Clock. And we have some students here, Ben Unra and Evan Littleton are both PhD students. And I know some of you were here last hour, so you all know what a PhD student is now, right? Can you nod enthusiastically? Yeah, excellent, okay, thank you. All right, so they're studying, and when they finish, when they finish this round of school, it'll be Dr. Unra and Dr. <laughs> Littleton. That sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and also in the room, I want to introduce Shihoko Kojima, who is the PI. Do you all know what PI stands for? That's the principal investigator. That means that she is the one directing the research that they're doing. So she has a PhD already, I'm betting. <laughs> and so she is a professor in biological sciences. And so she leads the research and helps these graduate students know what to do next. So there's your tidbit about academia and science for this hour. So with that, I want to introduce Ben Unra and Evan Littleton, and let's rock around the clock. Sounds great. So thank you for that introduction, and I want to start off with a question. And so I, I wonder, because it is the weekend, how many of you slept in this morning later than you would on the weekend? Great. See, let me get the guy in the red. <laughs> really quick. Why'd you sleep in this morning? Because it was Saturday. Because it's Saturday? Because you were tired and it felt good to sleep in, right? Perfect. Well, it turns out that these are actually things called our body's clock. And in particular, we call these circadian rhythms. And circadian rhythms are anything that happens around the same time every day. And this happens because we live on a planet where we have a night cycle and a day cycle, where, we norm where we're normally active during the day and we're normally not at night. So who can name a couple things that are circadian rhythms, things that happen at the same time every day? Go ahead again. Or you can get in. Um. Think it's Eating? Breakfast. <laughs> breakfast, that's breakfast. a great that's one. Right fun. in the morning, breakfast. That's a good circadian rhythm. Anybody else? Let's get one more. Lunch. 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 Yep, yep, eating. Lunch, eating. What else? Where do you go nor during the week? Breakfast. <laughs> Breakfast. Eating again. <laughs> She's got one. Very good. Very good. School. School. Exactly. Perfect. So let's go ahead and show them. So some of the big circadian rhythms we have is sleeping, waking, eating meals, going to school or work, recess, and exercise. And those are the big things that we think of that are circadian rhythms. Go ahead. 
But it turns out that these circadian rhythms aren't just things that we do in response to like looking at a clock on the wall. It turns out that our bodies actually have internal circadian rhythms. So we actually get more focused at different times and we get hungrier at different times. And that happens whether or not we know what time of the day it is. So go ahead. Now, there's some things that interrupt our circadian rhythm, some things that change what we do on a normal scheduled daily basis. Now, we already said sleeping in, but can anybody think of other things? What do you do when you normally stay up later? What, what causes you to do that? Any? She's got one. Um, when you stay up later, it causes you because you're not tired? Yeah, you're not tired, but are you more active? Are you doing something? Like... Uh, why, why do you stay up late? I usually stay up late either because I want to look at my telescope or okay. um, look at my microscope or some other reason. That's perfect. And I do the same thing. And then a lot of us also like to play video games or we like to text our friends late at night on our phones. And it turns out that blue light from electronics is one of the number one things that interrupts our circadian rhythms. Also, we have late night snacks. Now, that's a big one. I love eating cookies that are left over, but both of these things interrupt our circadian rhythms. Now, there's one more thing that's going to happen tonight that's going to shift everybody around the country's circadian clock. Does anybody know what that is? Mm, anybody know? You know? We'll let one of the adults daylight. answer. That's fine. Daylight savings. Daylight exactly. savings. That's perfect. <laughs> so daylight savings. Where we're gonna sh we get lucky this time where we're going to fall back our clocks. But in about six months, we're going to push our clocks forward an hour. And all of these different things, among others, will interrupt our circadian rhythms. But what happens when we interrupt our circadian rhythms? Now, some people, such as doctors or nurses and medical workers, have no choice to but to interrupt their circadian rhythms. And that's because they have to work overnight to help sick patients in the hospital. But it's, it turns out that, peop that people who work the night shifts, according to the CDC and the WHO, have increased risk for diseases like cancer, diabetes, among other things. And this extends to the lab. And I have a little example over here. We have these two different mice. And one of the mice, we made them eat around the clock. So that instead of just eating during the daytime when the mice would normally eat, we forced them to eat all around the clock. And it turns out that midnight snacking increased their risk for diabetes and also obesity. Now, this isn't, it turns out that even when the mice ate about the same amount of food, they still had these increased risks for these metabolic problems. Um, and that happens whether or not the calories change. So that's really, really interesting. Go ahead. But there are some things we can do to stop, our, to sort of lessen the impact of interruption of circadian rhythms. Now, who has a cell phone here? Does anybody? Go ahead and pull your cell phones out really quick. Now, I have a Galaxy phone, and my friend Evan over here, he's got an iPhone. So we'll show you both of them. And what we're going to show you how to do is turn off the blue light filter on your phone. And it's really simple. Go ahead and switch it over. If you can see my phone up here on the screen. For Galaxy phones, you just simply pull down the settings menu, scroll over once, and you'll either see something that says blue light or eye comfort shield. And simply hit that blue light shield, and you'll see the phone changes to more of an opaque color away from a blue color. And then you can also turn the brightness setting down. So Evan yeah. will go ahead and show you iPhone. And I'll show you guys and your iPhone. So some of you may, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that was real quick. So if you go to the settings in iPhone, and then there's a setting called display and brightness. I hope you guys can see this well. You can change the brightness, of course. And there's this thing called night shift mode here. And you can schedule what time is going to turn that blue light filter on. And then if you want, you can change how warm or cold the colors are. This would be less blue light here, more blue light here. So if you didn't figure that out during the, um, during the presentation, today, you can go ahead and come up to us afterwards and we'll show you that. But it's really, really important that you turn that blue light filter on if you're using your phone after 7 p.m. at night. Because uh, blue light turns out to be the color of light that entrains our body's natural circadian rhythms. It lets our body know that it's daytime. Uh, go ahead and show them that graph. Oh, yeah. This one. So there's also other things that we can do. 
And we're part of this organization called SRBR, and you may not be able to read these, and that's okay because I have pamphlets to hand out to you afterwards, but we like to promote healthy light exposure. And that's really difficult because it's the winter time and we normally have shorter days. And when we wake up, we're cold and we wanna just sit in our cold, dark room under our blankets. But what you should really get into the habit of doing is in the morning, turn on some bright lights and that'll let your body know it's time to start the day. It'll entrain your circadian rhythms to start the day. And the other thing you can do is get a little bit of physical activity in in the first half of the day, uh, sort of get your body's clock moving. And then at night, of course, you wanna try to maybe not use, not play video games as much late at night or maybe turn on those blue light filters or just read a book or listen to a book on tape with dim light. Now, the other big thing is that not everybody has the same circadian rhythms. In particular, teenagers actually have much slower circadian rhythms than adults. And as you age, your circadian rhythms actually speed up, and that's the reason some of your older, maybe grandparents, want to go to bed really early at night, and then they get up really early in the morning. And this isn't something that's uh, just preference. This is actually down to our biological circadian rhythms, and I'll talk more about that later. But what we like to do is actually advocate for later school start times, in particular, just by increasing the start time from maybe 7.45 a.m., to just 8.30 a.m. has been shown to drastically increase grades, concentration, and performance in schools, especially for teenagers. Go ahead. Now, I'm gonna shift focus a little bit, and we're gonna talk about what we do, because not all circadian biologists do the same things. I've been talking about these uh, large-scale circadian rhythms that we do in our bodies, but which of these organisms up here do you think have circadian rhythms? We have plants, bacteria, fungi, fish, and animals. Which of those do you think have circadian rhythms? So, you go ahead. You know. My guess is actually all of them. Perfect, he's got it. Go ahead and hit. So every single creature up here has circadian rhythms, and that makes sense because every creature on this planet has to respond to this day-night cycle, the sun coming up in the morning and setting in the evening. And so it entrains all their rhythms. Now, we actually study animals. So we we uh, study the animal's circadian clock. And who knows what's inside of our body, what our body is made of on the inside? Go ahead. What was the question again? <laughs> it's okay. So we have these, so our body is made up on the inside of organs. Who can name a couple of organs for me? Go ahead. Your heart. Your heart. That's, That's a, good. a good one. What else? Let's get one or two more. Your brain. Your brain. That's a good one. Any others? We got one more right there. Heart. Heart, okay, yeah. So in your stomach, your intestines, so on and so forth, all these different organs actually have their own circadian clock within them. And it comes down, go ahead and go to the next one. It comes down to every single cell has a strand of DNA that actually codes for what we call the circadian clock. And now who here has heard of genes? I just need to see hands. You've all heard of genes, that's great. So we actually have over a dozen genes that we call core clock genes. And these genes, just like the gears of a clock, form our, na our body's natural circadian cycle. So now, I wanna show you what we do in the lab. And uh, we, so, wait, wait, go ahead and wait, just oh. change it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so in the lab, we don't work with animals typically. Sometimes we do, but what we normally do is we grow cells on cell culture plates like this. So they could come from mice or other sorts of animals, and they'll just grow on a nice thin sheet here. And even the cells that grow in these dishes will have circadian rhythms that we can study. And what I wanna show you over here today is an example of an experiment where we're gonna actually extract DNA, and then we're gonna visualize that DNA on something called an agarose gel. Now, just I don't have a microscope here to show you today, but if you did have a microscope, these are actually pictures I took the other day in my lab, and you can see what the cells would look like under a microscope. The bottom one is a fluorescent image from a fluorescent protein. But now we'll go ahead and switch over to the experiment. So 
This is just a model of an experiment because to show you the whole experiment would actually take a few hours. So I'm going to skip some steps and some of these things are just uh, like a, a model to demonstrate. But the first thing you're going to do is you take, oh wait, safety first. We have to put on our lab coats. <laughs> and your gloves too. My bad. So once we have our lab coats on, now we're safe to actually work with the chemicals. And of course, our gloves. And what we'll do is we'll take one of these cell culture plates. And you can see this, you can see that we have three different kinds of cells. And that's because these cells are growing in something called cell media. And it looks a little bit like this. And there's different kinds of medias for different cells, but essentially this is just the stuff the cells are eating on the plate to keep them healthy and alive. Now this one, I already took the media off the cells and I can simply take this detergent to extract the DNA and pour that onto the top of the cells like that. And then I take something called a cell scraper and then we'll just simply scrape those cells off the bottom of the plate and we'll scrape them down into that detergent media that I showed you earlier. And once you have that done, you can go ahead and just extract those cells, put it into the tube, and then do something that we've all heard in the media probably lately called PCR to replicate the DNA. And now that we have the DNA, we'll replicate the specific types we want. For instance, those clock genes that we were talking about. And then we'll do something called Run, we'll do something called running them on an agarose gel. And I'm going to make an example of an agarose gel, but normally this would take about 30 minutes to make, so I'll just show you an example. It comes from this little tiny powder, and this little tiny powder that you can barely see in the beaker down there will make this big gel that I'm going to show you in a second. You can see that powder's nicely dissolved. And then we simply pour it into our gel mold over here. Now, if we had the magic of time, we would just wait about 30 minutes for that to set. But luckily, I already have one that's set right here. And the cool thing about this is that we just load our DNA into this gel and do a bunch of the different wells. And then after we run it through this contraption up here, that's sort of like um, an electronic device, what you would see is that the DNA would be separated into different bands. And based on where the DNA travels in the gel, we know which gene we're looking at, or the approximate size of the gene. And then we can do a cool thing where we go ahead and we can cut one of these little bands out with our handy dandy gel cutter just like this. And so just like that, I've extracted a little piece of DNA that could possibly encode for a clock gene. Now, I want you all to have an opportunity to come up here and, and uh, mess with the, um, look at the cell culture plates and possibly cut a band of DNA out for yourself. Now, you don't have to worry, parents, because Everything up here is safe today. I didn't bring any real cells or any real chemicals up here. So they can actually come up here and we'll have them put on gloves and you can look at the different utensils that I use and Evan will help you out with that. Now, we don't have enough room for everybody so maybe one or two students come up at a time. Uh, you two can, up in the first room, you guys can come up here first. And while Evan will help you out with that, I'll switch over back to the presentation. And while they're doing that, I'm going to ask you guys a few questions. And for the questions, I have some stickers to hand out if you get the question right. And the first one is, what percentage of the genes in your body do you think are clock-controlled genes or controlled by the circadian clock? Any guesses? Go ahead. Or five percent, maybe. Any other guesses? Oh, 
Here's a guess. A hundred? A hundred. Now, there's some people who think so, but not quite. What about in the middle there? Fifty. Exactly. Yay. Fifty percent of the genes in our body are controlled by the circadian clock. Now that may vary from organ to organ, but it's around fifty on average. So you can go ahead and hand out the stickers. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't worry, I have a couple more questions and I have more stickers up here. You guys need now, this one was talked about during our presentation. What color of light entrains your body's circadian rhythms? Blue. Exactly, blue light. Good job. <laughs> and just to reiterate this point, I'm actually out of uh, stickers at this point, but I do have, I have some non-science related stickers if you want those. But this is just a fill in the blank and I want a parent to actually answer this one. Teenagers want to wake up later than adults because they have blank circadian clocks. Is it lazy? Slower. <laughs> exactly, lazy. it's lazy. slower. So we may want to <laughs> say lazy, but it's actually not just that they're lazy, it's that they have slower circadian clocks. At least in most, in, in a lot of cases. Some of them may be lazy. But that's, that's going to go ahead and conclude our experiment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take your guys' questions. If you have any questions about what we do in the lab as biologists, or if uh, a couple more students want to come up here and look at this stuff, yeah, you two can come on up. What questions do we have? I'll get on my way. I have heard that if you want to reset your circadian clock, that you have to go through it the entire cycle. And that's it takes a long time. Is that true? That's not actually true. So it depends. Um, that's not true. Your circadian clock can shift either forwards or backwards about two hours every single day at most. So for example, if you fly across the world, um, you have to sh spend about six days to shift 12 hours to that new circadian cycle. But the idea that you have to go all the way around to shift back, um, I haven't heard that anywhere, <laughs> personally. Uh, it is harder to make, because human circadian clocks actually run a little bit longer than 24 hours, it's a little bit more difficult for us to go backwards than forwards. So that's why it's a lot easier for us to travel, um, you know, east to west instead of west to east, for example. But also, some organisms like mice, they actually have the opposite effect, where they have slightly shorter than 24-hour circadian clocks, and uh, they they usually um, would be easier to go the other way, essentially. But good question. Any others? I wrote one down. Go ahead. <laughs> You, um, you put on your lab coat to keep you safe. Right. Um, and I know that some people, you know, when they think of scientists, they think of lab coats. And I know that you're actually the only scientist today that have worn a lab coat, which is fine. Actually, w there was one more. One other one did wear, um, wear a Tyvek suit for the clean room. Right. Um, so my question for you is, how does a lab coat keep you safe? A lab coat keeps you safe. Because if I just tried to use, uh, I could put on gloves, but you notice I have all this exposed arm area. And um, a lab coat, it's not only long sleeve, but it also typically stays in the lab. These ones are clean lab coats. We were able to bring them here. But normally, if you spill something like cell cultures or even a virus on your lab coat, you wouldn't want to bring that out of the lab. And you could just simply take it off, leave it in the lab where everything else is already dirty and then go on your way. And then also it helps because it's long sleeve. Cool, thanks. Are there any animals that have sim similar circadian clocks to humans? Yeah, so there's actually a few different kinds of circadian clocks. And do you know what mammals are? Mammals are things like mice, cows, chickens, not chickens, cows, dogs, horses, so on and so forth. Almost all mammals and almost all animals have the exact same genes that make up the circadian clock. Now, these genes are slightly different between species, but for the most part, they all have the same ones. Now, there's actually some people who have mutations in the circadian clock. In fact, there's um, one family in Turkey who uh, has a circadian clock that runs about 20 hours a day. And so they're constantly going
going to bed early and then waking up earlier and earlier the next day. And uh, they have to have like really alternative work schedules to make sure that they can keep up with that. Wow. I had not thought of that. Had you thought of that? <laughs> Maybe your circadian rhythm would just be completely different from someone else's. So does this explain like the night person and the day person? Yeah, that's that's one thing that could explain it. So this phenotype, this family that they found in Turkey, they actually um, did something called the Thousand Genome Project, where they looked at thousands of people and they sequenced their genomes. And what they found is that about 0.5% um, of the population actually has mutations in their circadian clock that shift it more than two hours, 0.5%. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's one in 200 people. So more than likely, maybe somebody in this room could even have one of those mutations and not even know it. And they've just always thought they were a day person or an evening person. Hmm. Cool. What other questions do we have? I want to see what's happening over here. Did you have questions about what you're seeing over here? Um, I, I just wanted to know why there's so much tinfoil. Oh, <laughs> so the tinfoil, we actually wrapped the gels in the tinfoil to keep them from drying out before we brought them here. Because as you can see, these gels, they're made up of something like 99% water, and the rest of it is just this tiny little bit of gel in between. So if you just leave them sitting out in the air, that will evaporate, and it will turn into this little tiny um, shriveled up gel that will be like this big. <laughs> All right, did everybody who wants to get to see, and, and we can um, we can hang around for a minute afterwards. Yeah, I can hang out for a yeah. little bit afterwards if you guys want to come. And talk. Oh, he's got another question. We have another question. Let me come. Let me come right this way. Why did we? Why do you have to boil the agar? Oh, to boil the agar. Um, well, I actually showed when I was making the gel today. I had a mock gel made up because I didn't want to bring the actual one they would have to boil and everything but um, you actually have to boil the auger to get it to dissolve into the solution normally or else it won't dissolve it'll just stay as this like cloudy uh, debris <laughs> it'll look like dust in the water why did you not bring real germy things because I like because I like getting all messy. So originally I wanted to bring I wanted to bring some cell cultures and I wanted to bring a microscope and have you all come up here and look at the cells in real time under the microscope. Unfortunately, there's actually just laws in place that prevent us from bringing those to kids. Thank you for not breaking the laws <laughs> today for the Virginia Tech Science Festival. One more question here. I was just wondering what you thought about naps. Naps. Um, I've never been a nap person. I there's there's actually some species of organisms that have naps built into their circadian clocks, and uh, some people think that humans do. <laughs> some people think that humans do, um, but I haven't seen good evidence for that. So, for example, a lot of bugs, they're really big on naps. They actually always nap in the afternoon when it's really hot because they'll dehydrate. So there's some basis for naps being necessary in our circadian rhythms uh, but other than that they can't hurt if you do them at the same time every day as long as it's still in a typical pattern from the first time you're born like if you have like how when you go to sleep in your schedule does that stay like um, your circadian clock like no forever? you're oh go ahead sorry <laughs> sorry for interrupting you but no um, when you're born for the first three or four months you actually don't really have circadian rhythms and that's why a lot of babies come out and they wake up in the middle of the night and they go to bed at irregular times and it takes about four months for this uh, these genes to actually really kick in and develop these circadian rhythms for you um, and those circadian rhythms will change throughout your entire life. And I kind of talked about it earlier in the presentation. But essentially, as you get older, your circadian clock will run faster. And then um, eventually you'll be going to bed really early and waking up really early like your grandparents. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we are at time. So um, Ben and Evan, I want to thank you so much uh, for your excellent presentation. And Shihoko for, for leading the way here. Um, 
thank you all for your great questions and attention today. Um, what a fun time we've had, and I've learned so much all day yeah. long, but especially, like, I did not know this about how important, I didn't, the four-month thing, the yeah. first four months about the babies, that's really helpful. New, new parents, take heed. There's hope. Um, so I do want to encourage you, those who are under 18, to please complete our evaluation as you leave today. And feel free to hang out and have some more conversation. And be sure that you pick up one of the goodie bags if you have not already. Um, and there are robots in there to do. Uh, Grown-ups, you're welcome to pick one of those up as well. Um, when you do that robot, though, just put that thing together. Uh, pay close attention to the instructions and do it where you have a table. You can lay it all out. It's not uncomplicated. Thank you all for a great Virginia Tech Science Festival Day. What a what fun time we've had. And we will see you again another time soon. Bye-bye. We'll clap for ourselves. <laughs> oh, uh, if everyone could come up here and take one of these, or you, just one per family. I just wanted to hand them out. They're SRBR forms talking about daylight savings.